Hello everyone, welcome to Field Notes, an exploration of functional medicine. I'm Rob Downey, a family practice MD and Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner. I'm coming to you from Seaworthy Functional Medicine in Homer, Alaska. Seaworthy exists to help people overcome their health challenges and be fully vital. Today we are fortunate enough to be joined by Dr. Sally Lamont a naturopathic physician and Chinese medicine acupuncturist with decades of experience and wisdom in many domains. Good morning, Sally. Good morning, David. <laughs> Pleasure to be with you. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much. I've been really excited about this. So as we were getting ready for today, one of the things we were chatting about is that you uh, fit the archetype of my mentor, a naturopathic doctor and Chinese medicine acupuncturist and functional medicine trained natural physician who has part of her DNA is that she worked with and learned from Jeff Bland 30 years ago in the Seattle area. And you mentioned that Jeff Bland was at the foundation of your nutritional training. Yes, yes. I was uh, fortunate to be in the, the first naturopathic medical school in the country, the National University for Naturopathic Medicine. And um, Jeff Bland was my nutrition teacher. And so it's been an incredible experience watching uh, the uh, integration of, of lifestyle medicine be developed over these years and and that's when Jeff Bland coined the term functional medicine. And, mm -hmm. and here we are today, decades later, with uh, an international movement of interdisciplinary docs uh, bringing mm -hmm. this medicine to the people. Yes, yes, indeed. And I should use the honorific Dr. Jeffrey Bland. Um, uh, so I, I don't want to forget to say that. And for those of our listeners that don't know, the father of functional medicine, as you noted and a, a singular mind in his capability to keep it all together in one place in his head all of the interrelationships of our body's physiology and organs and nutritions and uh, nutrition minerals cofactors genetic expression just an incredible luminary and you know one of the things that's unique about jeff is he is not just a left brain this is one of those rare individuals that has a fully de developed right brain and is emotionally intelligent. Yeah. Uh, so when you put those qualities together, that's where you get functional medicine. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I can't, I can't resist um, sharing not as name dropping, but just because it was such a privilege. I got to interview him about three months ago, and I, I read a story where. Um, Michael Stipe from REM was at a concert and then his uh, favorite producer ever was in the same room. It might've been Brian Eno or something like that. And Michael Stipe reports just being speechless, right? Like he just was robbed of words because it was such a big deal to him to be in the presence of this person who had influenced his musical journey so much. And that was the challenge with Dr. Bland is just that he's affected the fabric of my life and my patients' lives. and so. It was really something. And that this is a watershed moment in that both you and Dr. Daly uh, were all sort of beneficiaries. I think then his wisdom flows downstream through all of us and the people that benefit. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So make sure and add please to your bio any, anything I forget you do a lot of different kinds of work and I think we'll focus on, immu on immunity today um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic and because it's such a big part of your work, but also you work with people on uh, vitality in aging, uh, gut conditions, a whole host of different things. And to give folks a trailer, you've got Dr. Sally's Kitchen and you've also got an immune reset protocol. So there are resources for people to connect with you and learn and, and do more. And I think at the end of the interview, we're gonna want you to unpack that for us. But, um, and I should mention also, you were the physician of the year from the um, American Naturopathic Association in 2001, which is wonderful. So um, just many, um, Many, many distinctions with, we could go through, but let's start with immunity 
because everybody's so concerned about it right now and it matters so much even without a pandemic. And you indicated in the materials you gave us to get ready that you've got a way of describing innate versus adaptive immunity that'll help our audience understand it better. Should we start there? Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I wanted to talk about immu the immune system today uh, because I wanna help your listeners make the connection between the way we eat and live and our immune potential and our, our you know, kind of the chronic health problems that we have because our, our daily choices really do determine our health outcomes. You know, you have influence over the way your body performs and it really does respond to your daily choices. So I wanna start by saying, let's use this winter wisely to grow our health so we can come out of this pandemic stronger than when we even went into it. So um, when it comes to the immune system, I, I actually think of it as, as almost magical. It's your own built-in internal defense team that works 24 seven to protect you from foreign invaders. So, you know, we have these branches to our immune system. You mentioned the innate and the adaptive immune system. And I actually wanna start with just one more that's sometimes I think we don't realize, and that's the barriers that help to protect us from uh, foreign invaders. And uh, like a fortress around our home, the first line of defense is really our skin. You know, it's designed as you know, there to protect you from cold and wet and the sun and an endless array of germs and toxins. Um, but beneath our skin is our digestive tract, which is really our inner skin. And um, it's a mucosal surface that is really the front line in the battle between the outside world and the inner world. So maintain the health of these barriers, both our outer skin and our inner skin is really critical. So with the barriers um, in mind, I wanna um, introduce the concept of the innate immune system and innate means kind of built in, it's, it's here from the beginning. And it includes a, what I think of as a squad of white blood cells. And these are things like neutrophils and lymphocytes, monocytes, macrophages. You might've seen these terms on a, on a CBC, on a lab uh, that your doctor's done in the past. And this innate immune system, you know, comes out of the bone marrow, which you can think of kind of like boot camp, uh, where it trains these little infantry soldiers to um, get out there and migrate through the blood and the lymphatic system to the damaged tissue to do their work. And the thing with the innate immune system, all these white blood cells, is that that response is fast, but it isn't very specific. And this is where our, what we call the adaptive or the acquired immune system comes in. And um, this branch of the immune system is slower to respond because it's acquiring information from the innate immune system. It's learning from those white blood cells. So when it meets a pathogen, it can create a very specific response. And so this is where the T cells and the B cells come in. And I want to take just a second to introduce you to those guys. Um, T cells and B cells are um, like the generals and the special ops forces in the army because they've received specialized training. T cells are trained in the thymus gland. Actually, it's down here under the sternum, under your breastbone. And that gland, um, actually instructs the T cells to target and to destroy um, a, uh, their enemies, basically. And there's a whole bunch of them. Interestingly, um, research is showing now in terms of COVID that these T cells have some memory of uh, coronaviruses because we've all had colds and flus. So the T cells um, offer a, another line of defense against this infection that we're currently dealing with, the COVID-19. And the full significance of that has yet to be understood, but it looks like we do have some protection and depending on how well we've taken care of ourselves can, can have a, 
uh, a T cell response that could be significant. And then, and then finally, there's the B cells. And these ones are trained in the bone marrow, hence the name B cells. And they produce antibodies to foreign invaders. So bacteria, viruses, pollens, allergens even have a protein on their surface. That's an antigen. And B cells recognize and bind with that antigen. They form an antibody. And that fits onto the antigen like a key in a lock. And once bound, that antigen antibody complex is targeted for destruction and elimination. So vaccines train our B cells to recognize an invader so they can prepare for the infection. And when an infection does come along, the B cell portion of our army is there to respond. Excellent. That's fantastic. I should mention as we segue into you educating our audience, who I want to thank for joining us today, that uh, the Institute for Functional Medicine, the three terms that they're using that have to do with functional medicine and COVID-19 are uh, resistance, resilience, and recovery, because Institute for Functional Medicine wants to be careful to say that uh, functional medicine isn't uh, sort of curative per se. And at the same time, I think those words are really beautiful clinically because they're reminding uh, clinicians and our patients and those that are learning about functional medicine that uh, these barriers that you're talking about and uh, just not getting COVID in the first place, we that we have an impact on that. And then our ability to withstand uh, or be resilient in the face of COVID, if we contract it, we have a ton of impact on that. And then we know now that the amount of vitality people have in the bank coming into this is gonna affect the long-term health of their lungs and heart and brain and avoiding brain fog, et cetera. And so again, I'm just so glad that you'll be be helping folks know about some specifics. And we should talk next then about, about food and lifestyle, how these things build uh, a strong immune system and keep those barriers working. Is that a good, a good next piece? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and I think part of the problem that we have in, um, the United States and why we have such a high incidence of infections is because people haven't really been taking very good care of themselves. We've kind of been getting away with becoming a country that's obese, that has a lot of heart disease, diabetes, uh, cancer, and um, you know these conditions clustered together, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, um, obesity, high blood sugar form, um, a condition we call metabolic syndrome that about 30% of Americans have. And this creates a state of chronic inflammation that just really requires lifestyle change to prevent the worst outcomes of COVID-19. So in my book, the first thing we need to do is work with our diet to reduce this chronic inflammation. Um, do you want me to say a few words about inflammation, what it is, um, acute, chronic, or have you already covered that? I think that's been covered enough in uh, prior topics. Great. But, uh, but probably you and I should flag it that, the, that we know that COVID leverages inflammation as one of the ways that it wreaks havoc. And so if the fire's burning already of silent or not so silent inflammation, and then that's one of COVID's main MOs or ways that it really messes with folks. I think that sets the stage for how important it is to quench that, quench exactly. the fire. Exactly. And, and I think one of the best ways to do that is with diet. Um, and for me, it starts with getting off the blood sugar roller coaster, um, meaning we really need to shift our diet away from all the refined and processed sugars, um, white flour, white potatoes, white rice, that um, while comforting in the short run, um, really do set that stage for chronic inflammation and um, diabetes, pre-diabetes. So the focus in, in my book really needs to be on, um, I love the Mediterranean diet. Um, and that can be adapted in you know, different cultures around the world, but it's really a nutrient dense plant-based diet that includes high quality oils like extra virgin olive oil, um, fish oils, avocado oils, 
lots of brightly colored vegetables and fruits that are really rich in fiber and phytonutrients. Those are the, the brightly colored pigments that are in vegetables and fruits, and they actually communicate with our genes, instructing them to reduce inflammation and, and function properly to uh, support our health. Um, you're lucky to be up there in Alaska where you have access to so much <laughs> wonderful, clean protein, so much great seafood. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, and I'm thinking even wild um, animals, you know, mm -hmm. like you're, you get the, the meat that's richest in the omega-3 fatty acids because this is in fact a refined meat mm -hmm. that you guys have better access to mm -hmm. than I think we do here. Yeah, definitely. The audience is going to include a number of Alaskatarians that are on a Mediterranean diet plus moose and salmon. So yeah, <laughs> thanks for flagging that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't I, I I didn't think so much of moose. I, I was kind of thinking of deer and elk, but uh, I, I'm curious about moose meat. Well, we're on the Kenai Peninsula, and if I have the numbers right, in 1950 there were more moose on the peninsula than humans, yeah. and obviously that has uh, tipped. But uh, just in terms of where these charismatic megafauna love to live. Montana, my home state, is loaded with deer and elk, and Alaska is just loaded with moose. Yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> it is cool. It's really fun. And of course, you know, there's folks that are plant only, and that's great, and there's folks that want some animal protein, and um, I, I support them. I think the different functional medicine luminaries have, have staked out a number of positions that make sense, whether it's Mark Hyman or Ocean Robbins. And so I just work with where people want to come from philosophically. And I think there's plenty of clinical science to, to support a number of versions. I, I agree of completely. This. Yeah, there really isn't any particular diet that suits everyone. Um, we've probably both seen people de determined to become strict vegetarians, you know, find that over time their body is actually maybe more adapted to have some protein in it. Mm -hmm. And then there are those people who have come from just meat and potatoes, who as they begin to introduce more vegetables into their diet, find that their health skyrockets. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. on, in my book, balance is really the key. And mm. listening to your body. So you, mm -hmm. um, and, and then seeking the support of a doctor trained in functional medicine that can help you define, uh, dis, uh, determine if you have nutritional deficiencies and help correct those. Excellent. Excellent. I want to add to what you're saying and underscore that part of the genius, again, of Jeff Bland and everybody at the Institute for Functional Medicine in this larger community, I think, is recognizing that these are individualized plans. Yeah. And even though I've been doing functional medicine for 14 years because of my mentor, I started seeing, uh, I did applying functional medicine in clinical practice in 2006, and I saw patients with my mentor every Wednesday for years. And wow. We were both present in the room, but now it's just the last three years or so that I feel like I'm approaching the caliber of her expertise. Any of us that have mentored with a mastery level provider then at some point find, oh, my skills are finally, you know, getting there. And one of the really big things has been how nuanced the person's food plan is. I really have come to think of it like a tailored jacket. And I've paid really close attention to how people feel. I feel that that body intelligence is very powerful also, that uh, when folks say they feel puny or uh, th their body's telling them something. I just had a really wonderful visit today with uh, a, a super insightful, engaged uh, patient who just started using a continuous blood glucose monitor. Mm -hmm. And the specificity of this person's food plan combined with this data it's just mind blowing the amount of real time engagement with feeling terrific and the macronutrient ratios between healthy fat protein and complex carbohydrates. So, yeah, that's that that's brilliant because those like a continuous glucose monitor and so many of the new tools coming on, they help us listen to our body in a way that we we weren't trained to. But if you really tune in um, and understand symptoms as feedback from your body 
to your mind that something needs to change, then you can begin to examine what does need to change. You know, our bodies yeah. are incredibly wise. Um, it was our, one of our, another one of our functional medicine mentors, Mark Hyman, who said that we have 37 billion billion chemical reactions happening in our body each second. <laughs> and it's this you know, symphony of uh, chemistry that's going on in there, keeping our, in an attempt to keep our body in really optimal balance. Unfortunately, we just don't live in a manner usually that supports that. So like you said, tuning into your body, uh, listening to its signals, and then we're really responding with tender, loving care. Mm -hmm. Instead of disdain and disgust, and I'm just going to go take an antacid or whatever, but mm -hmm. instead, you know, greeting that symptom as a message from your body to your mind to uh, reset the course a little bit. Another thing that's really changed for me because food's so important, I'm really glad we're talking about it, is that uh, I used to be very prescriptive about food, but I think some of my patients' experience was that I was trying to make them live like a monk. And I don't think I realized until about three years ago uh, that uh, I think a much more accurate description is these food friendships. Mm -hmm. So as people love their new friends, they just automatically hang out more with their new good friends and less with their, uh, the old crowd maybe wasn't serving them quite as well. And it's this positive affinity with foods they love yeah. The, that's their pantry, their snacks, their meals, who they connect with. And I'm going to definitely have a blast talking to you about that community you've created. Uh, but these, these affirmative, life-affirming relationships with food, it's just so different than I should. And right. people come back to us and they say, oh my gosh, if I'd known that just putting whole food in my fridge and pantry and preparing it would just completely revitalize me. I'd have done it a month ago or a year ago or five years ago. I just can't believe how effective it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's one of the reasons that um, I, I've been doing Facebook Lives intermittently about to start up another set um, where I, I do a, a segment called Become a Veggie Lover and just try to introduce somebody to a food that they don't know about and give them tips on how to prepare it and um, its nutritional benefits. It's really fun to see people come back and say, Romanesco, you know, that crazy looking <laughs> relative of the broccoli and cauliflower family that, you know, yeah. it's got a spiral uh, shape. Yeah. It's very trippy looking. It is Fractal. filled with fabulous phytonutrients to help fight cancer, mm -hmm. to improve mm -hmm. our gut flora to help detoxify pollutants and, and estrogen specifically for women. And yet most people just walk by that veggie. They have no idea what it is, what to do with it. So mm -hmm. I, I think introducing people to new foods, helping them make friends with them, teaching them how to integrate it into their diet, mm -hmm. turn their friends on to it. <laughs> really right. reinforces um, a positive change in diet. Then it's real, then it's for them, and they're, they're in the mix rather than conjectural. And the thing I see happen is I, I find in retrospect, folks are very intimidated. And the coaching data uh, that my coaches shared with me is that one person in 20 benefits when the doctor gives them a handout. Whereas when they've got a community or a friend or uh, a, a, a way to do this in real time where it's actually, they played it. And they go, oh, that's delicious. Or I don't like that. I'm not going to prepare that again. Or, oh, I see the steps. I put this in the fridge. Then I prep it the day ahead. Then it's in the mason jar when I need it, when I'm busy. Just all of these um, little obstructions taken in toto are a, an insurmountable hurdle for a fair number of people unless we can facilitate the startup or continuance of their success, I think. Yeah, that's true. Well, we're going to um, uh, be coming back to the uh, communities that you've created in your program. So um, aside from food, uh, maybe it'd be categorically called supplements or minerals. Uh, but again, in the preparatory materials for today's session, you mentioned that there are things like melatonin and vitamin D that people ought to be really aware of that are mission critical. Should we talk about that for a minute for immune support? Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> 
melatonin, I'm glad you mentioned it, uh, is, is critical. You know, many people think of it as a supplement that they could take to help them sleep, but it is way more than that. You know, it's something our body makes when the light starts to dim in the sky and um, it, it isn't a sedative, it helps our body begin the process of ramping down and beginning to go into that regeneration mode. But um, more recently, uh, studies have shown that um, melatonin actually promotes the activity of several types of immune cells, including the natural killer cells and lymphocytes to help fight viral infection. And amazingly, melatonin even helps block the pro-inflammatory cytokines that go in there and create that cytokine storm. So um, getting adequate sleep is critical and probably supplementing with melatonin. Although I, I think we both wanna make the disclaimer right here that there's, you know, we have yet to have a body of proof that would state that taking melatonin is a treatment or a cure for COVID. It isn't, but we're learning so much in this last year about the ways our body naturally fights infection. Mm -hmm. Melatonin is one of those components and as foundational as melatonin is just the act of making sure we get enough sleep. We are mm -hmm. about six weeks away right now from, as we record this from the winter solstice, December 21st, mm -hmm. 22nd, the shortest night of the year. And we ought to be like those bears just banking sleep because while we're sleeping is when our immune system is actually in its regeneration phase. It's not out there fighting during the night. It is reorganizing, regenerating. And without adequate sleep, um, we cannot be as resilient as we need to be in our ability to resist infection. As I was, I was reviewing, reviewing yeah. functional, functional medicine, medicine for COVID about um, three months ago, I was seeing that one of the first things that drops when we're sleep deprived is our immunity, even before we feel sleep deprived. I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of fascinating to me that people need to keep that, uh, that sleep rolling uh, and not go by their sleep meter, as it were, but just make sure and get a good restorative sleep every night. And it's such a, it's such a cornerstone and foundation of vitality in every domain anyway. It is. Yeah, and the sleep meter, people's sleep meters are so disturbed these days by the electronic devices that we uh, mm -hmm. constantly have ourselves in front of. And uh, the blue light that emanates from them actually turns off melatonin production. So when mm -hmm. you're sitting there at midnight on your phone or um, a laptop or a TV, it, it, that LED light actually suppresses your natural production of melatonin. So um, I think it's, I find it personally helpful to use on my iPhone. The, 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 they have a bedtime function that actually reminds you it is time for you to, <laughs> to begin mm -hmm. to ramp down for the day. And um, don't listen to that part of you that wants to stay up and watch one more episode on Netflix. And <laughs> right. instead, uh, rely on a tool that can help you get the sleep you need. You know, one of the other things you mentioned was vitamin D. And I just wanted to touch on that too, um, because mm -hmm. we are, um, as we approach the winter solstice and lose even more of the sunlight, our body's natural ability to produce vitamin D plummets. And so it's an essential time in my book to know your vitamin D level. Um, make sure that whoever you see as a doctor is checking that vitamin D. And in functional medicine, we want to see your 25 hydroxy vitamin D be in the kind of 50 to 70, 80 range. Uh, about 40% uh, of the population of the United States is below 30. And um, almost half of the world's population is also. And that's when we run into an inability to fight infection properly. And that's because vitamin D 
is um, it supports our innate immune function in a number of ways. It helps white blood cells fight infection. It supports macrophages, another kind of white blood cell, and neutrophil to function properly, to fight against viral diseases, and to protect the lung from injury and tamp down uh, the pro-inflammatory cytokines in the lungs that are wreaking havoc with COVID-19. There are studies pouring in from around the world. The latest was just a week or two ago from Spain uh, showing that vitamin D supplement, first of all, that low levels are associated with the worst outcomes of COVID-19 mm -hmm. and that supplementation to get vitamin D levels up can really reduce the risk of the worst outcomes and, and of even colds and flus. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I advise people to soak up some sun, and uh, if you can't do that right now, um, supplement with the high quality uh, vitamin D3. Thank you so much. In Alaska, our levels are, our prevalent levels are even higher uh, because of uh, how far north we are. Mm -hmm. And so there have been a number of pushes in Alaska to really increase awareness about just endemic problems with low E and the consequences. And I think getting D levels where they belong is such a great example of functional medicine because this idea then that, uh, I, I suppose I think of it this way, Americans, uh, since the advent of penicillin, have often looked for kind of a silver bullet for problems. And it's natural that Americans would drift into one item, one fix, one diagnosis, one fix thinking, uh, though it's not helpful given that about 80% of what folks need to take care of has a complex chronic backstory that includes lifestyle and needs a complex solution that involves lifestyle. And so I think most of the folks that are resonating with functional medicine as a way to be better prepared in, in the, uh, this, this COVID situation we're dealing with, they, they resonate with the idea that we're not looking for a silver bullet, we're looking for silver buckshot, many things. And yet it's so commonsensical in other domains. If, if a batter on a baseball team hears from the coach, you need to tilt your front foot a little bit and you need to settle your hips a little more and not have that elbow drift up. Well, that's, and then their batting average goes up. It's, you know, common sense. And so I think most functional medicine patients and, and consumers are, they get it, that there's this overall uh, improvement in multiple domains if we do things that uh, work in harmony with our bodies. Uh, and then again, we've got good solid, solid data. Should we talk about your, um, your food, your, your programs, your food community? I'd love to know how people meet and learn there. And it's a, you said it's a chance in the preparatory materials I was given for people to share information. And this seems to me like a game changer in, in, in what's happening in functional medicine. I think of Mark Hyman, uh, Daniel Dan. I think of my coach, our functional medicine coach here in town just started a challenge that's improving outcomes right now because she's having people share with one another and learn together and so this, is this the Dr. Sally's Kitchen component of how you support yeah, I, people? I, I, so, you know, like you, there in a in a practice, there's only so much we can do in an office visit. So I created Dr. Sally's Kitchen. Dot com as my um, educational platform. So I do a blog every week. I just did one on vitamin D and, and immunity. And um, I put out a series of healthy recipes. There's dozens of recipes there and a highlight on the healing power of food. And to take it a step further, um, I've created a, a five week online course, The Healthy Immune Reset. Now that's gonna run again in January and it's five weeks of kind of fun-filled adventures in food <laughs> because <laughs> so much for me, it all starts with food. Um, so, um, but the focus is, is gonna be all around building a healthy immune system. So we'll have 
um, five weeks of video training on the immune system and I'll do questions and answers and we will do some community building, um, a challenge of getting off of sugar. I'll introduce a number of uh, new veggies that have a real immune benefit that people kind of forget about and, and may overlook. One example are mushrooms and, and especially mm -hmm. medicinal mushrooms like shiitake. Um, have profound benefit on our immune response. So I want to introduce people to these kinds of things. And then we're going to really drill down on these um, foundational lifestyle principles of exercise, of um, sleep, of connection, because um, mm -hmm. we all know how critical connection is in this time. And um, without it, uh, people do resort to self-medication. <laughs> And um, mm -hmm. so uh, I think it's especially important as we enter these winter months to have a community of people to um, help, as you said before, reinforce positive um, lifestyle changes that they've learned and, and really support each other. Nice. Yeah. I'm so glad you're doing that. I'm so glad that resource is there for people because again, I see it. I still see the real world implications of people having the lights come on the connections, the support, the recipes, the change in the pantry, the change in shopping, and then their eyes brighten, their skin gets rosy, you know, they they shift into that uh, yeah. vitality. Um, it's so true. <laughs> you also shared in the information you provided that if you had to pick one thing that's the most important potentially, it would be this idea then that people prepare their food and Mark Hyman has flagged this so many times over the years, this idea that it's a really healthy revolutionary act on our own and others' behalf to obtain and prepare whole foods. So how about elaborating on that for our, for our listeners? Yeah, um, yeah, I think that uh, I, I might say learning to cook, but it's really more about learning to prepare food. Um, uh, it puts us in the power position. We're not just dependent upon, you know, what a local fast food place might give us or what a friend might be making. Um, we're in control when we um, have the opportunity to uh, plan ahead just a little, put together a, a simple, uh, you know, how to, I teach people how to build a clean meal and a balanced plate. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you can mix and match a variety of the right carbohydrates, the right proteins and right fats to create a really brilliant, healthy plate. And once you know those key ingredients and how to mix and match, um, you're in control of your health instead of being um, a, just a, a kind of passive <laughs> recipient of whatever food comes your way. It's simple mm -hmm. and it's easy and it's actually fun. You know, mm -hmm. I think if you learn to cook, you, you, you will never be bored because there's an international uh, world of food out there. And, you know, while I might promote the Mediterranean diet, it, it can easily be adapted uh, to the East, to the West, to the Indian style of eating or to a more Asian style. And I think mm -hmm. if we, we keep it fresh by not necessarily eating the exact same thing every day, but learn to introduce some new flavors, learn what to do with ginger and turmeric, and it can transform you know, a simple um, cup of lentils into an exciting Indian doll <laughs> one time, or it could be more of a, a French style of, mm -hmm. of, um, of a lentil soup uh, mm. or an Italian style. So uh, mm. I'm, I'm very fond of uh, using food as medicine and helping people make friends with it and how to work with various uh, fruits and vegetables and proteins and, and, you know, learn the good fats and, and uh, options to the really funky carbohydrates most people live on. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I wanted to share a couple of examples as a way of adding to what you're saying, because mm -hmm. I think uh, another thing that often helps our audience is the empowerment of specifics or anecdotes. And I think they sometimes assume that, that, um, 
people like Mark Hyman, you know, are almost out of reach, right? Somebody who eats that impeccably, that consistently. Mm -hmm. um, and so for people to be aware of this, uh, this process, not perfection type yeah. uh, engagement. And we were really lucky to have these incredible farmers that do our CSA for our vegetables. And so when I read from Isabella Wentz in the Hashimoto's protocol that she puts her salad for the week in a jar on Sunday, that that's what got me and my wife to having a salad a day at lunch every day. But I learned which uh, lettuces will by the end of the week. Mm -hmm. And I learned in winter to switch to, um, you know, uh, a little kale maybe or spinach, you know, that's a little heartier. I also found that um, broccoli, raw broccoli didn't do terribly well in a jar because I think the, I suspect the, maybe it's the sulfur content. I'm not entirely sure, that but is. the whole thing gets kind of gym socky by the end of the week. And, so, yeah. you know, again, just these adventures with food have been really interesting. I've been really struck too by uh, so many uh, folks are really intimidated just by like, they don't think of themselves as cooks or they've had bad experiences and I often find they do best with just one simple thing they can do like chia pudding with blueberries and make a week's worth there's just something to get started and get that confidence that it's mm -hmm. not it's not so hard and that it's fun right right yeah I have a number of, of, of breakfast ideas I'm kind of a protein powered breakfast girl um, but you know a, <clears throat> it doesn't have to take more than 10 minutes to throw together a good breakfast and it can often even be a uh, a, a version of last night's dinner so you mm -hmm. know you might have some polenta and you throw a big handful of arugula one of the winter greens that's a little more hearty and just mm -hmm. uh, soft boil a couple of eggs that's six minutes put throw that together and you have a, a really delicious throw a little avocado and maybe tomato on it and it, that's a that's something you can put together in a manner matter of minutes that'll keep your motor running all morning long. Oh, you're making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> it's an hour earlier in Alaska while we're doing this interview, so you're making me segue into my plans for the yummy mid morning thing I'm gonna prepare. I can't resist saying that uh, my daughter just laughed at me like crazy because. Um, I should just share this as we're wrapping up. I was telling her about how much I had never known about what a great, uh, delicious green that was. And I mispronounced it a regula. Oh, uh -huh. And she just laughed and laughed. And so then I always use these little mnemonic devices and we've got a dog in our house that's howling all the time. And so I just remember that it's arugula. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> our Samoides. <laughs> it's a great green. It's it's not boring. It's got a little bit of a peppery feel to it. Mm. That um, it's a little like spinach in its consistency. It's you know a darker yeah. peppery green, but it's so delicious. And it's part of the cruciferous vegetable family. So it's related to broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels uh -huh. sprouts. And it's one way to make sure you're getting a serving of those really powerful vegetables. Um, that help our bodies stay, stay strong and, and detoxify. I think the flavor is exquisite. Yeah, a little goes a long way with all the cruciferous veggies. It, it, yeah, right. And I think it's good to rotate those. So it's not just broccoli every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a whole range of them. And mm -hmm. I, I am going to be doing a Facebook Live and putting out a recipe next week, uh, right before Thanksgiving, uh, for um, roasted Brussels sprouts with toasted pecans and r r really a delicious recipe that I hope your listeners will join me at. Mm, nice. Well, we're so fortunate, me and the, the audience getting to um, benefit from your wisdom today. My pleasure to join you, David. It's it's really been fun. I'm I'm so happy for you to have uh, found your calling and 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 move into the functional medicine space. You are you are healing the world up there, one person at a time. Well, back at you. Have a have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. <laughs> Already, bye. Seaworthy exists for people to overcome their health challenges and be fully vital. Please consider subscribing, giving us a five-star review if we've earned it, 
and going to our website podcast tab for any questions or comments you'd like to share with us. Thanks.